Good morning, everybody, and welcome to a chilly Nottingham. Uh, it was snowy yesterday, but just chilly today. I hope you're well, and welcome to this morning's Yardstick webinar, our penultimate webinar of the year. And delighted that we are being joined today uh, by Joe Glover, who is the founder of the who's the founder, co-founder actually, Joe, of the Marketing Meetup, uh, which has got a lovely strap line, uh, the Positively Lovely Community for Marketers. Positively Lovely Community for Marketers. Really love that. Um, before we get into this with Joe, talking about a whole range of things, um, we'll do the usual start. And Dan, just tell anybody who's new around here how we do things. Yeah, sure thing. Thanks, Phil. So welcome to today's session. I um, hope we're not all snowed in. If you are, at least we've got an interesting webinar to all pass the time together, haven't we? So what do we all need to know? Um, as Phil alludes, um, if this is your first ever Yardstick webinar, first of all, welcome. Um, but second of all, we encourage as much participation as possible. So your microphones and cameras are not on, but you can still talk to us. So send us a comment in via the chat or use the Q&A box um, and have your say. So ask questions about the things Phil and Joe are discussing. Tell us you agree, um, or even better, tell us you disagree. You know, it's a safe space. We're all here to learn. So let's all make the most of the hour. The format when we have a special guest is that Phil will lead with his own questions for Joe, but I'll be sweeping up your comments and questions at regular intervals throughout. So don't worry, we will get to your questions. Um, and before we start, I'll answer a question now that we often get. So we absolutely are recording today's session. So a video will be sent out along with a summary of any links or resources mentioned. We've got our very own Abby Robinson to thank for that. So a big thank you to her as ever for diligently working behind the scenes. Now, enough of me. Um, let's have some of Phil and Joe, shall we? So over to you guys. Yeah, Dan, thanks, mate. Right, so Joe, I thought we'd start by, we have the lovely Rory Sutherland on the screen, who was on our webinar earlier on in the year. And, and he says, uh, Marketing Meetup is definitely one of the good guys. And I've watched your community build over the years to 51,387 marketers. And it just always strikes me that it's a really vibrant, kind, loving community. So just tell us a bit more about the history why you started it, what your aims are, what your vision are for, for the community, Joe. Sure, no worries. Um, so hi, everyone. Thank you for taking the time to, to tune in today. Um, my story starts eight years ago. Um, so the first thing that will become apparent about myself is that I'm, I'm, I'm a quieter individual. I, I, I'm, I'm more introverted than I'm extroverted. And so when I was working as a, a solo marketing manager walking uh, in a small business, I, I had this sense that I wanted to meet other marketers and learn about marketing. Um, but the traditional answer of attending events uh, felt like something that was a little bit in inaccessible to me. Um, mainly because you walk into those spaces and people are stood in those circular formations uh, and, and they tend to judge your humanity not by you know, the contents of your character, but by your job title or your budget, which of course are heuristics, you know, for whether a conversation is going to be one that people want to have, but nonetheless, it felt like people were valuing the wrong thing. And so in a canteen in Cambridge, uh, I just started a group. Uh, I called it the Cambridge Marketing Meetup and uh, plonked it up on meetup.com, not really expecting anything to happen. Um, but lo and behold, for the first event, we had a, a hundred people sign up. Um, and it being a free event, then 50 people turned up, you know, but it was still a good result. Uh, the marketing meetup at its core with our in-person events um, is uh, a speaker, a nice buffet, and this instruction to be positively lovely, which is all about folks coming into the space and, and looking to value the human beings in front of them, to be kind, to be elevating, to be inclusive and, and lovely. Um, that was kind of mission achieved. So when you said in your, your question there, Phil, about vision, like I actually achieved the vision uh, from day one, which was, you know, just create this space that felt lovely. 
However, uh, over the past eight years, this hobby has turned into a job. And this job is now running nearly 200 events uh, across the world from London to Tokyo. Uh, our little community in Cambridge has turned into 50,000 folks uh, across the world. Um, uh, our social following is like a quarter of a million people. And, and each week we're reaching you know, thousands of people uh, attending our events. Um, it's a kind of wild journey. And, but the thing that I, I sort of feel most proud of is that at the core of it, the values have stayed true. You know, we come together to look after each other, to make things better. And uh, I think even though the scale is different, then, then the values stay very much intact, which is, which is really lovely. So it's good. It sounds as though, I'll take the screen show off so we can see each other a bit better. So <laughs> it sounds as though you know a thing or two from Cambridge to Tokyo and are building, building communities. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the a lot of people on this call are financial advisors, financial planners, and their clients don't know each other, generally speaking. It might be one or two links, but generally speaking, their clients don't know each other. So they're a fairly disparate group of people. What tips have you got? Actually, let's start in a different way. What are the benefits of creating community? And then what tips have you got? to help the people on this call create a community of their clients. Nice. Um, so the benefits, I, I, I think the principal one that, that um, we, we can speak about is the, the currency of community is opportunity, um, which means to say that you just don't know what's going to happen um, because community at its uh, most pure expression is a human experience, which is uh, people coming together to be stronger than they would be alone, to elevate one another and, and make things generally better for, for, for one another. And, and with these things in mind, then you get these folks into a space to share an experience and you just don't know what would happen. Um, it could be that folks find new jobs. It could be that they, they find uh, a new partner to go mountain biking with. Uh, it could be uh, that someone uh, decides to create a new business off the back of it. But fundamentally, the currency of community is opportunity. And, and I think that first and foremost is uh, the thing to bear in mind when, when looking to create community. Uh, in terms of creating community, the thing that I tend to speak to is really the commonalities of the emotion that um, we, we look for. So if we're creating a community for our clients, we can look at the functional things. And I think it's important to. So with the marketer meetup, you know, we are a bunch of marketers. That is a very functional thing. Uh, we, we come together to, to learn, meet, get better, et cetera. But the story that I just told you wasn't one about we get together every month and we, we learn about things. The story I told you was one about emotion, was one where I was scared and I wanted somewhere more kind. And I think that's really the spirit which holds these things together. Um, to, 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 to give a, an example of, of why that's important, I'd been running the marketing meetup for three years in my spare time, in evenings and weekends. I was traveling around the country, running these events, uh, hopefully having a nice time most of the time, but um, you know, not always, you know, it's, it's hard graph too. Um, so that was between 2016 and 2019. In April 2019, the marketing meetup revenue matched my salary, and so I decided to go full-time on TMM. But everyone knows what happens in March 2020, which is COVID. And all of a sudden, the 130 events that we had planned for that year disappeared in a flash. And had we not had the commonality of the emotion, but rather instead we chose to focus on the, fu on the function of events, then like my events business would have died in that moment but instead there's a community which exists around these emotions this common storytelling these ideas which are very very human and all of a sudden instead of doing in-person events we start doing things online and the transition was seamless and so really in answer to your question always focus on the emotion you know this is a human experience and and, and humans have emotions uh so f finding those is, is is always the most useful thing in my opinion and it's interesting you um you went through some challenges clearly march 2020 like anybody who ran face-to-face -face events there's um this chap called brad burton 
who runs the four networking groups um, and clearly Brad had challenges at that time as, as well as anybody did who runs those physical events. Mm -hmm. If you've got our audience today is largely financial advisors, financial planners, mortgage brokers, and then representatives from organizations who support those businesses. If you are attending today and you're thinking about running events next year to mm -hmm. try and create community amongst your clients, what are the pros and cons for you of face-to-face -face events versus online events, Joe? So we think about them in two slightly different ways. So it's really good to point out the distinction between the two, Phil. Um, so the first is for the online events, we tend to take more of an educational perspective on things. Okay. So we run weekly webinars uh, every Tuesday at two o'clock and we get a guest speaker in similar to this format. Um, and the intention behind that event is education because it kind of fits, you know, uh, people sat at home, they're taking notes. There is a lot of chat uh, in, in the chat function. So people are, are learning together, sharing experiences. But the primary thing we're looking to do in that, in that um, situation is learn. There is the additional benefit of the online stuff, which is the reach is so much bigger. So for example, we ran a webinar yesterday, we had a thousand people sign up for it. And like, we wouldn't be able to get a thousand people into a physical space, um, but because we were able to bring people in from like Switzerland, Cape Town, blah, 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 uh, we had that reach. And so that's a real pro and reason for doing the online stuff. For the in-person stuff, we still have a talk at our events. Um, but really, that's a hook. That's a way that we speak to get folks in the room, have something, a point of conversation, which they could uh, have a chat with a stranger about, you know, and, and sort of go, you know, if it's about, I don't know, social media strategy, you know, they may ask a question about social media strategy and how you find it. But really, the point in those situations is to create those serendipity moments, you know, those things, that opportunity that we've already uh, sort of discussed. Um, so the focus there really is on human connection. And so the ways that we facilitate that and is very lo-fi. I'm, I'm not saying that we do anything particularly special. Um, is pizza, beer, a nice space. But like the fourth most important, important principle and, and that I think can easily be missed is that in the environment of our in-person events, the thing that we work on is culture. And it's through that instruction of being positively lovely, you know, come into this space to look to benefit each other and make things better. Because anyone can do events. Anyone can do events and, and they are what they are. But for an event to feel like our event, then we want it to be positively lovely. And there'll be different versions of that. You know, like, I don't think that everyone should run positively lovely events. I think some, some people should run aggressively salesy events if that's what they want to do, you know, or or negatively nasty you know whatever it is that you want to do but have some thought around the culture that you want to create um and this is this is this is the magic bit which is my experience is that if you ask people to be positively lovely it generally will be um and and i think the same goes for whatever cultural expectation uh, you set for your community it sounds like what you're saying is to create an event create an successful events you need a, a thing, a hook. Yours is positively lovely. It could be, could be something else. Yeah, I mean, partially. I mean, in, in two different ways, really. So for me, I, I view a successful community as one, or the, the implementation and creation of a community and a community organiser, the thing they should be focused on more than any other thing is that culture. I think that goes such a long way. In terms of getting bums on seats at events, there is a far more functional task as well. So there are some topics we know which will fill a room a lot more nicely, you know, stuff around AI, stuff around social media marketing, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so I am obsessed with the culture bit, um, but I am also aware that there's a very functional reason that people attend our events and you do need both. And if we look at the online world for, for a moment, because I think in our community, there are more advisors, planners, who are considering up for running online events than they are physical face-to-face -face events. Mm -hmm. Barrier to entry is just lower. Mm -hmm. From a functional side, what top tips could you share with our audience today for getting people to sign up 
and getting people to show up. Nice. <laughs> um, so we could we we all look through the world through our eyes, right? And so my most recent experience is that the greatest thing that we've done in terms of bringing people to our events every week has been growing our newsletter. And so this isn't a direct answer to your question because when you're starting from zero, you don't have a newsletter list necessarily. Um, but I would encourage you to do so um, because uh, uh, having the benefit of a prompt to go out to folks um, to attend an event uh, is really, really useful. In that spirit, actually, one of the things that is, is well worth knowing is that we get about half of our signups on the day for the events that we run. So we consciously schedule our events for 2 p.m. in the afternoon because we'll send an, an email reminder at 8.30 in the morning of the day of the event to say we're running this event on this day. Um, my guess would be that the majority of the folks who actually show up for the event subsequently are within that sort of 50% of people who sign up. Um, there is an expectation thing. So um, on webinar signups, uh, even if you get a thousand people sign up, you're probably going to run at a 30 to 40% attendance rate. Um, so at that point, it's about making the content available afterwards. So you said it at the beginning there, Dan, about making the recording available, etc. So we make it available via our podcast and our YouTube, um, which have been growing steadily in the background as well. And so now the Marketing Meetup podcast is like a, a top 10 in the UK marketing podcast, which is, which is wild. But what it speaks to is meeting people where they are, you know, and so some people love to attend an event like this. We've got like we've got people like Paul in the chat here uh, who who's brilliant, you know, who's contributing in the chat and sort of making the event what it is. Um, but then you've got, you know, folks who want to engage on the podcast, on YouTube or whatever it may be. And we're providing those opportunities. And so that provides a really lovely content flow as well, because you've got some great content for your site. Um, in terms of showing up, there is an additional thing, which is, I think, uh, being bold uh, to a certain extent in um, reminders um, is OK. And so we will generally send uh, two automated reminders uh, through Zoom. So one a week before and one a day before. In fact, three, because we do one an hour before as well. Um, but then we'll also do a, a customized template uh, through the marketing meetups uh, CRM through HubSpot. And so there's a lot of reminders that goes on to folks who have signed up as well. And, and the messaging in that place is, is not one of aggression or like, see you there, you know, or else it's just like, we're really looking forward to seeing you there, you know, and, and we've created this for you and, and we hope you have a lovely time. Um, and so those reminders, they're okay to do. And I, I wouldn't step off the gas, so to speak, uh, with them. Um, to my knowledge, you know, I, 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 I've been doing this for four years with the online events and we've never had a complaint about someone who sort of said, you know, you're reminding me too often about uh, your event when at once I've signed up for it, et cetera. Um, so what we've spoken about already so far is getting people to your event. Then there's an encouragement about getting around the newsletter. Um, before the event, we're speaking about regular reminders. And then after the event, we're speaking about turning that content into something that can be digested afterwards in whichever way that people would like. Um, of course, it's slightly different at the very, very beginning. So this will be my, my final point probably, which is if you're starting from point zero and you haven't run an online event before, then I'm afraid there is almost no escaping just elbow grease. You know, uh, getting in touch with every person you know, uh, finding you know groups that are similar to 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 the folks that you would like uh, to come along, building partnerships with organisations who have access to lots of folks that you would like to speak to, um, using the speakers network uh, to get them to to uh, sort of advertise the event for you. Um, all of these things, unfortunately, take time. Uh, they take a bit of thought. But at the end of the day, you know, this is how you start to get going uh, at the beginning. Um, of course, there is a very functional thing as well, which is making the content compelling for people to come along. So, uh, But I don't think that's actually a trivial point, which is just making sure you're listening to what the audience wants, 
not the event that you want to put on because if it's dry if it's boring if it's not what people want they're not going to show up because they don't have to that's about meeting people where they are going back to what you said earlier exactly. i think some of some of the advisors planners that i admire most this year are the ones that have put on online events they've taken themselves out of their comfort zone they run webinars and one of the things we've noticed is once they've done one they get a bit of a a buzz for it they really enjoy it they really enjoy presenting and they, they go and do another one another one another one but there is a lot of elbow grease in getting people to sign up and show up unless you've already got a relatively large and engaged audience mm -hmm. you clearly have both of those things so if you've got people on this call with kind of no audience mm -hmm. or if you've got people on this call with an ambition to grow a larger audience just get really practical for us with hints, tips for doing those two things and growing the audience size. <laughs> um, sure. Well, I think I think the first thing to say is um, one can only speak from one's experience, right? And so I've I've been um, running the marketing meetup now for eight years. Um, and so we have got to the place that we have got to um, because we have shown up week after week day after day um, and shown up for a, a very long time at this point in time. I had hair at the beginning of this process uh, to, you know, to help people uh, have a genuine sense that, that we want to benefit their lives. And so I think the first bit of advice that I can give, which is both philosophical, but hopefully very practical, is a forgiveness that you can give yourself um, that you're not going to see results after day one it just doesn't work that way. Um, it, it, you know, there are some people who could maybe throw millions and millions of pounds at, at these things and, and land with a real splash, but I'm going to assume that's the 1% rather than the 99%. Uh, so speaking to the 99%, the avenues that have helped me um, have been through the generosity of in-person events. So showing up for these in-person events, they're generally free. Um, and the way that I initially got folks to those events would be messaging folks through LinkedIn mm -hmm. uh, and also uh, doing sponsorship relationships with other organizations who wanted to speak to a lot of marketers, but doing them as contra deals. So no money exchanged, but instead, as an example, a local recruiter who would want to get in front of lots of marketers, I asked them to email their database about our events and in turn, um we treated them as a sponsor for that event and so it was a zero zero pound exchange um but we got some exposure to the local community and they uh sort of got a sponsorship slot um linkedin outreach so one of the first things that i did uh in every location whenever we used to start them was i would go through linkedin i would craft a message uh which was non-salesy um hopefully warm uh, usually in the spirit of hey phil uh, i'm looking to start a new networking group in nottingham for marketers i wondered if i could invite you along and that would be it you know i think a lot of folks would make the mistake probably of trying to do the world's longest thing and tell everyone everything that they need to know about that but just getting that permission in the first instance to tell someone about the thing that you're doing, whether that's a networking group or a webinar, I think so long as it's targeted appropriately and is respectful of people's time, they can go yes, they can go no, they can ignore you and all are fine. Um, so, so they would be uh, some things. An additional thing that has served the Mark Timita very well is my own personal brand over the, the, over the years. Uh, it feels completely icky uh, to sort of say the word personal brand out loud um, or even to acknowledge uh, that that's a thing. Nonetheless, uh, through showing up on LinkedIn where my people are, so to speak, um, then I've been able to sort of, over the years, it's now turned into a fabulous source of friendship, of kinship, you know, of uh, conversation. But then when the the, the business needs it it's also an opportunity to speak about the events that we've got uh, the sponsorship opportunities and whatever it may be and perhaps we can go into slightly more tactical things on personal branding later if that's useful um I may or may not be um 
those are probably the three things that I do up front. The last thing, which I think is really, really important, is this point of uh, momentum. And I think it references what you mentioned initially there, Phil, which is people get the bug and they want to do it again. And this relates to my first point on time as well, which is you need to show up in the first instance. But then once you do, you can then start to build that momentum over the course of time. And one way that I think you can sort of supercharge or, or fast track, I don't know why I just said supercharge, that's the most corporate thing I've ever said in my life. Uh, one way you can fast track this process is simply by asking people to ask their friends to come too. What you'll find is that if you, in our case, if we've got a positively lovely group of people coming to our events, then why would their friends not be positively lovely too? Why would their colleagues not be positively lovely as well? And so there is a profound difference in asking, would you mind telling your friends versus not asking that in terms of the amount of advocacy that you gain uh, from your community. And so as a, as a very practical tip, making sure you're asking the people who show up to recommend is absolute gold dust. It's so simple, but if you miss it, then it's one of those things that is a real missed opportunity to build that momentum uh, going forwards. That what you said a few minutes ago about the contra deals mm. is something that a lot of the advisors planners on this call could do something with because they will have links to local accountants and local solicitors and they could go to the their next webinar they could go to the local accountant and do that contra deal i'll give you free sponsorship of this and you'll get x y or z if you mail it out to your database Absolutely. That's a that's a fabulous idea, Joe, that a lot of people can take forward. It, it's super easy. The only the only sort of appendix on that is that um, lots of people speak about partnerships. And so, again, I, I live my world in my context, as every person does. And I would probably get four or five messages per week about some form of partnership. Someone asking me to promote something, someone asking me to like something, whatever it may be. And so there has to be a clear value exchange. And that's why, you know, sort of the idea of um, you will be a sponsor at this event is a clear value exchange rather than just saying, hey, I'm looking to do this thing. Do you mind messaging? Um, and it feels like that should be a moot point, but I don't think it is because a lot of people, you know, with the asks that I see at the very least kind of go, hey, do you mind just promoting this to uh uh, you know to to your database which is a lovely thing and you want to help as many people as you do i mean that's why we exist but by the same token if we said yes to everyone who just asked us to promote something then um the audience would get so tired the community would get so tired of seeing messages from anyone so it's got to work both ways and you get those messages because of your personal brand well, if nobody knew you you wouldn't get those messages so okay. Let's talk a bit about personal brand and the importance of that. Yeah. You know, like it makes me feel kind of, a, you know, not your question. I mean, I've, I've teed up this conversation, so this is entirely my fault. But even the idea of personal branding makes me feel a little bit uncomfortable because it does feel like, you know, I just kind of want to show up as myself and, and I generally think I do. Uh, so to acknowledge that um, people think of something in that way that, there has to be a take uh, is is uncomfortable for me, but nonetheless, let's let's speak to it because it is it is a truthful thing. Um, so the way that I express my quote unquote personal brand is is through LinkedIn, um, and the reason I do that is because I find myself more comfortable expressing myself through my written words than I do my my spoken word. Um, I'll lie in a dark room after after this hour uh, and, and I have to recover uh, of conversation. Um, but written word is something I, I feel quite comfortable uh, doing. And so for me, when I speak about my personal brand, what I mean is I am showing up on LinkedIn posting regularly uh, content, which is um, which is true to myself. <laughs> so, but let's unpack that because if you're starting... I'm eight years into this journey and so saying I post content true to myself is not particularly instructive for someone who's just starting their journey. So the things that I would like to be known for um, are probably conversations around marketing, 
uh, conversations around introversion and quietness, because that is something that fits very core to who I am as a person. And more recently, I, I also have conversations around sort of mental health and uh, parenthood, because these are, you know, things that are you know, sort of core to my, to, to my personality. So these are things which I will speak about regularly. And so these are the components of my uh, personal brand. Now, if I was to try and translate these things into something which is useful for the folks watching in today to, to actually do uh, with it, then I'd start creating a table. So at the top of my table sits these four things. You've got, you've got marketing, uh, mental health, uh, quietness, and, and being a dad. And so these things would sit at the top of my table. And then underneath these things, there are a series of points that I will quite regularly make about each of these things. So from a marketing perspective, I choose to take the time to elevate, create examples of marketing efforts. I will uh, take the time to uh, speak about people in the industry I like. I'll, I'll showcase and discuss ideas and examples that are interesting to me. Uh, in the second column, say, for example, around mental health, then I may sort of speak about my past with anxiety or whatever it may be. Now, with each of these things, these are the things where you sit down at the beginning of your day and you go, I don't know what to write today. And instead, you can go to your table and you can see that you've got these four columns and you've got a series of things that you're willing to speak about underneath each of these things. And then you show up. You show up every day or as often as you're comfortable with. And, and there is no prescribed amount of times you should be posting, but you show up at least consistently within these themes. Uh, that express you and your humanity. And that's all I've done. That's all I've done for a very long time. The nice thing is that because this is true to myself and, and stuff like that, it's not a work, then um, it's relatively easy for me to write because I enjoy it. Um, but then I'm able to show up day after day with these ideas and, and, and so on and so forth. And over the course of time, a personal brand builds and people gravitate to you or they don't. I'm sure there's a lot of people who see me as being way too twee and that's fine. You know, I, I'm, I'm okay with that because I've got a great group of people who feel as I feel or recognize the world as I recognize it and want to be part of, of my worldview for whatever reason it may be. So the point of encouragement here, really, if you're starting at point zero on your personal branding stuff is a, to acknowledge that it's valuable, uh, B, to probably take the pressure off your shoulders uh, and just kind of enjoy the process rather than feel like you need something uh, to get out of it straight away. And then C, sort of think about these, these pillars, whatever they may be for you, um, that, that can inform how you post, how you show up, uh, in, in, in this case, in, on LinkedIn, but it could be wherever it feels relevant for, for you and your personal brand. And have you got any negative pillars, things, that, places you won't go, things you avoid? I, I guess by virtue of the ones which I've listed, then yes, but I don't, I don't write down the negative things. I mean, so for me, a really important value that I hold is that I want to be elevating in our industry, which specifically means that like, you know, and I don't know whether this exists uh, for you in the same way, um, whenever I go on LinkedIn, I just see people trashing other people's work or saying horrible things about the industry or, you know, yesterday Jaguar released the rebrand and, and like the vitriol around that was horrible. You know, I, I thought, you know, this is someone, this is a group of people who are clearly trying to do a thing, whether or not it's been successful. Um, I'd rather spend my time speaking about a really good example that I really love rather than shouting down something that I really hate. Because that's, you know, without meaning to get too woo-woo, that's the energy that I want to put out into the world. You know, I want to be putting out a positive energy rather than a negative energy. And so, yes, I think the short answer to your question is yes, uh, but that's more based on values and, and the things that I've spoken about uh, rather than a declared thing where I'm like, you know, I'm not going to speak about this or whatever it may be. Yeah, that happened recently with the, um, I'm in Nottingham. And the Nottingham Building Society launched a rebrand recently. And that got panned uh, in many ways. And I actually really liked it. <laughs> and I'm going to come to Dan in a minute with a question. Nice. To look at the questions. But Joe, did you talk about password anxiety a minute ago? Did I hear that correctly? No, not password anxiety. Oh, sorry. 
Past history of anxiety. Past history of anxiety. <laughs> Sorry, I misheard that completely. Right, let's gloss over that. Dan, questions in the chat. Yeah, sure thing. So we've got a few. Um, so the first I'll ask is a uh, friend of the webinar, Paul. So going back to promoting people, um, Paul says, presumably you have other filters on who you might promote, for example, quality of offer slash integrity of supplier. So talk to us a little bit on how you filter slash vet people that you might promote. Uh, yeah, it, you know, so the nice thing for us is that this, this term positively lovely has become an instruction at our events. It's become a cultural value and has become a question. So we ask ourselves a question, uh, is this positively lovely? And if it's a no, then then we don't do it. And if it's a yes, then, then we do. Um, and so Paul is absolutely right uh, that there are additional filters that, that sit within that. Um, but it comes down to values. It comes down to the things that we hold true. And, the, you know, I've chosen to build my community, my business in such a way which holds ourselves true to those values and like, Money's cool and all that, you know, but like if you want to build a business which has longevity and meaning and, and enjoyment to it, then I don't think one sort of spends a lot of time doing the things that you really despise doing or doing it with people you don't want to do it with. And so for us, you know, like positively lovely is the benchmark, not only of the, the behaviors we choose to exhibit, but also with whom we choose to do it. And of course, you said the opposite of positively lovely is negatively nasty. So maybe it's just <laughs> avoiding that negatively nasty, isn't it? I bet as a bet. Brilliant. Okay. Um, so um, Rishab asks a question too. Um, so their question is all about how LinkedIn can help with marketing, um, especially for financial services, given our audience. But just in general, what's your take on the role where of LinkedIn and, and marketing? Yeah, so... I I think you find your people on LinkedIn. So I have found myself very much in a marketing bubble because that is where I've spent my time. Um, I think you can do the same for financial services. Um, to give an example of a, a third sort of industry, there is a chap that I know who has established a lot of credibility very quickly in the biopharma space um, because he has embraced the principles that we're speaking about, about consistency, about showing up in certain ways. Um, and if anything, it could or should even be slightly easier because I would suggest that the marketing space, while there are some advantages, marketers speak about things um, in, a, in, a, in a, but we're also like very, very keen to have our say. And so it's quite a saturated space. I would suggest based on my experience, and I could be wrong about this, that in the case of the financial services, et cetera, if this is a skill set or something which isn't seen as immediately like really beneficial, then there could be a real opportunity quite quickly to build some credibility as the person who posts on LinkedIn uh, and, and, and sort of uh, create that space for yourself. Now that might be a complete stereotype. I don't know because I don't live and breathe in your world. And, and so I need to acknowledge that I know nothing um but but um I, I would certainly say that there is there's space for folks uh regardless of sector or industry you know just talk a little bit about how often you undertake certain activities on linkedin mm -hmm. hosting engaging audience building yeah and why and how you remain consistent with those things so I, I, in, in many ways, I am a terrible case study <laughs> so, uh, because I don't think I post to LinkedIn with the same pressure that some other folks do, which is I choose to express myself, you know, and my thoughts through that social platform. And so I do so with fairly little expectation that anything will come off the back of it. Now, there is an irony there, which is I think in doing so, I'm probably doing it closer to the right way than someone who is uh, spending all of their time trying to get something out of it. And so that is why I find myself comfortable speaking about stuff around mental health and being a parent and stuff like that, because I'm not expecting a direct result from it every day. It, to, to the point of your question, therefore, I, I spend most days you know, I'll sit at this desk 
or go for a dog walk or whatever it may be and and have a thought and and post it out to the world you know and that's probably once a day uh you know not at weekends necessarily because I, I don't want to be checking my phone while my family's around and, and stuff like that but you know I'll, I'll do that once a day and I'll probably spend I don't know 45 minutes to an hour on the platform a day not because I think that's an optimum amount of time to be spending on the platform but just because I enjoy it you know and, and I like that interaction with other people and I think that's something that is probably quite important to note which is that I don't really do Instagram and I don't really do TikTok and I can acknowledge the opportunities in those things, but I don't tend to engage in them because I don't really want to. And I, I think when it comes to this idea of consistency and showing up, then you kind of have to have this sense of internal motivation that is something you actually kind of want to be doing. And so um, I, I don't benchmark myself against numbers and I don't recommend that people do. I, I think in my experience, and again, this is only my experience showing up as often as you would like to in the shape that you would like to with the acknowledgement that you are attract the people who feel as you do uh, feels really important. There is an important element to this, however, which is, I see so many folks head to LinkedIn and, and of course we've all seen a lot of it recently in, in the time of like redundancy or when they need something. And I just remember this quote that someone lent me a long time ago, which is build your community before you need it, which means to say, you know, like if, if, if you're showing up and there's that sense of um, needing something from the community before you've taken the time to give to it, then one can expect less back uh, from, from that interaction. And so if this is something that you wish to engage in, then I would suggest that you do, uh, because there are a lot of benefits that come off the back of it. And, and take that in whatever shape you would like to, in the shape that motivates you, but probably before you need to, because I think... Uh, I think that creates opportunities and similarly to um, the currency of community uh, is opportunity. Then I, th I think the same applies to these social media channels. And it sounds a very organic approach that you've adopted there, Joe. Mm -hmm. uh, does AI play any part in what you do on LinkedIn, whether it's, God forbid, commenting, writing posts, and um, audience building, etc. Because I've heard a lot of people, and you can see it, you can spot an AI generated image and post and comment these days. Does yeah. AI play any role in it for you? Um, so I, I, I use AI periodically, probably more regularly to generate imagery for social media, I, you know, in, in that case, I'm not trying to pretend that like this is a drawing that I've done, mm -hmm. you know, uh, et cetera. And so in that instance, you know, like it's, um, I think it's fine, you know, create imagery using AI and stuff like that. When it comes to AI trying to impersonate you uh, through your words, uh, through commenting or posting, in it rubbish, <laughs> you know, it's just, you know, it's, I, I personally would not like me to be represented in that fashion uh, through 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 those systems because a it's you know why are you doing it I mean the AI commenting and stuff like that is just so thin and as you rightly point out people can recognize it that you're not you're not really gaining anything you're just commenting you know in theory, you know, and same with the post. I, I think we started today's session with an acknowledgement that the commonality in creating community um, exists somewhere in the magic of identifying emotions. And in doing so, if, if, if one is to look at these AI applications where you're commenting and, and posting using these things, I think you're stripping out a lot of the things that people would actually really love to engage with you on. So if AI doesn't have a role to play in terms of commenting and writing posts, 
for you and you've done some fabulous sessions uh those educational online sessions about ai where do you think ai has the biggest wins for marketers right now i use ai every day in so many ways in fact so on my iphone um you know you can set like a little button on on the side here uh which sort of gives you a quick access to something I've now set that to have a quick access to ChatGPT's voice function, to have conversations with ChatGPT to, to, to hash through things. Um, to give an example, this morning I was writing a brief because we're running a conference in next year in, in, in March. And I was writing a brief for our design agency uh, about our visual identity and the things that we would like creating off the back of this. And so I had a conversation with ChatGPT where I was like, these, these are the things that I would like to get from this brief. And then it helped me with a back and forth, uh, narrow down the things that I should be briefing on and then created a brief off the back of it. So I use ChatGPT every day, uh, sometimes in place of a human to sort of work through uh, some of these thoughts that I may have. And indeed sort of, you know, I, I don't like, you know, I find the, the 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 physicality of writing on the keyboard i think we'll look back on that in like 50 60 years or something like that and go what the hell were we doing you know sat down at a desk you know typing into a keyboard this time so to have those conversations with that computer which can then spit out something which feels probably better than i can write by myself there are those opportunities so a no, directly answer your question to work through thoughts uh, is is a wonderful thing um there are other applications, and I think it depends on the source material. So, for example, when we're uh, writing up our webinars, um, we will now uh, take the transcript from the webinar and we will put that into a chat GPT and ask it to pull out some of the key summaries. So we have a very human uh, input, but then we sort of ask chat GPT to, to, to expedite the process in terms of getting an output. So in terms of some content writing, which is then subsequently um, edited by a human, is checked by a human. Um, there is some stuff there, um, but that's kind of run of the mill content. That isn't like the hero content that will be seen by every person who will judge uh, the marketing meetup by that content. That definitely needs to be written by a human. There are opportunities everywhere, I think is, is, is probably um, where I'm getting to. But I think, with the whole AI conversation, like this conversation around AI currently will be like in 10 or 15 years, like someone saying, what do you use the internet for? You know, it, it's, it will just become a background function of the tools that we use on a day-to-day -day basis that may or may not uh, change our working habits and, and stuff like that. And in a different way to like, I don't know, uh nf nfts you know that came out last year which were quite clearly a bad idea you know the ai stuff will augment how we work um and so i don't think it's for us to fear or discount or or anything like that because the sort of the cat's out of the bag uh with it but it is for us to use acknowledge that sometimes it's a little bit like the turkeys voting for christmas and like i think there's some people who are celebrating some things about ai which i think are terrible things to celebrate um but then there's also a lot of stuff that we can we can use to speed up some processes so a very very general answer i'm afraid phil because ai by its very nature is a very general thing um the last thing i would say therefore is it's on the strength of the prompts right and so with the conversation element of things in the first sort of prompt that I'm giving any AI, I am probably writing four to five paragraphs of detail to get the best thing that I possibly can from it. And whether that's through spoken word or written word, uh, doing those things and being very clear what I want from the output. If you're treating it like a Google search or you're writing, write me a blog post about financial services, of course, you're going to get a load of rubbish off the back of it. And so it's how you use it, when you use it, uh, valuing the tool for the brilliance that it brings and also the, the, the terrible things that it brings. 
I love the idea of chat GPT being another human in the room or a human in the room. Yeah. And bouncing off it. Um, it can, can help you at all sorts of times of day when there is no human interaction around and available. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I mean, the example of the brief writing thing this morning, I ended up with a pretty decent brief written in three minutes that would have taken me an hour um, in normal cases. And of course it's for me to then edit and, and make better, but as a, as a starting point, it's pretty fantastic. Yeah. Um, let's go back to where we started the marketing meetup. Mm -hmm. And when I put the slide back up, which is, uh, hopefully everyone can see the marketing meetup slide now. We have the wonderful Rory Sutherland um, giving you a lovely testimonial. Mm -hmm. So not only have you got the lovely testimonial there, you've got the halo effect of having somebody um, very well known, mm -hmm. uh, very closely aligned on the screen with your brand. That's cracking social proof in our world with dealing with financial advisors and planners one of the things we talk about is showing potential clients the benefits of working with you is far more important than telling so what i want to do is just finish off today um, around social proof and the importance of financial advisors and planners having more of that social proof online how important has it been for you guys at the marketing meetup and how important is it generally in your view? I think it comes in, in lots of forms, right? So um, social proof could be, you know, I know that you had Rory uh, speak at a recent webinar, for example, and there is a social proof in uh, Rory deciding that you are worthy of him spending his time with you in the same way as he has deemed us worthy, you know, of spending his time. And, and, and there is a social proof there because he carries cachet associated with his role, associated with his TED Talks, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so, so that's the first thing, you know, and, and a lot of the marketing meetings momentum over the past four years has been built off the back of those things. So Rory Sutherland, Mark Ritson, uh, Seth Godin, uh, April Dunford, you know, these are incredible human beings who each carry their own personal brand, which they lend to the marketing meetup. And by them simply showing up, uh, then, you know, you did it before we went live today. You know, you asked, how was uh, a specific person? You know, how were they? And and you acknowledged that. And then, you know, you probably associated that with TMM. And in a way that probably elevated our community in your mind. And so uh, in, in, in that way, you know, there is that. There is also more overt ways, such as what we've done with the Marketing Meetup, which is placing these quotes and testimonials on our website, which again sort of reinforces that idea. And the logic behind that really for us is that if someone lands on our site for the first time, they immediately so see someone they recognize. They see something which sort of says, uh, this is this is good. And then they go, you know, even if it's a split second decision, they go, cool, I'm going to keep on scrolling. I think that's all we're really trying to do with social proof here is if we're not getting the direct benefit of someone else's audience come to along to our things, what we're trying to do is just provide some legitimacy, uh, some, some trust in our organization. So with TMM, you know, this manifests itself in keep on scrolling. This is the first thing you see, but then down below, you'll see our events, you'll see uh, our conference, you'll see our recordings and stuff like that. By having that initial hit of, oh, okay, these guys are legit then you kind of take it a little bit more seriously. And so I, I think that's kind of the long and the short of it really is that, you know, folks have lent their brand to us in one way or another. And we have asked permission uh, to, to, to then display uh, their words and, and their ideas on our site to just encourage that scroll to, to, to get that legitimacy. And if people on this call want to get involved, going back to one of the comments Paul made earlier on, actually, right at the start of the webinar. Lovely. And, yeah, it was a positively lovely comment, wasn't it? Cheers. It was. Paul's a legend. <laughs> um, how does someone get involved with the marketing meetup? Um, so you can come to our online events, which are free to attend. Uh, you could go to one of our local events, in-person events, which happen in uh nearly 30 locations across the uk and um, about five or six locations across the world 
Uh, they're just a donation ticket, so you pay what you'd like to pay to attend those. Um, you could get the newsletter, which again is is free to get, um, and you would be informed about both the webinars and the in-person events on those as well. Um, or you could come to our first ever conference next year, which happened on March 20th. And uh, that was a big, scary thing to do, but it's very, very, very exciting uh, to be able to do it. Well, we'll put some details about the conference in the follow-up to this email, if you're happy with that, Joe. Absolutely. Um, Thank you. The donation for the events, pay what you think they're worth. That's an interesting <laughs> Just talk to us a bit more about that. Do people pay before the event or after the event? Uh, before the event. Right. So, so our events were free to attend uh, for a long time. Um, but post-COVID, we made the decision to... Um, to do this this model which was you know uh, pay what you'd like to pay uh we we suggest between three and 30 pounds and so it usually averages out at about five to ten pounds roughly um really that was there rather than to solve a revenue problem it was there to solve a respect problem and a sort of attendance problem which is when you're running free events then folks are very can very easily sign up and can also very easily not show up what we've noticed with this and you know it's it's a pretty profound thing that if people pay i think it was three pound fifty uh, the attendance rate shoots up from something like 50 percent to like over 70 percent um which for a relatively small amount of money um you know granted not every person has three pound fifty so um folks can show up uh for free if we want or get in touch with us and, and we would always let them in um but with 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 that sort of small psychological thing then i think we're showing respect to our audience we're giving value to the event uh as i say we we, we run a relatively lean business in terms of uh, overheads and stuff like that. So we're not there to solve the revenue problem, but we're just there to solve the, the respect problem really more than anything else. That's a great tip. That's a great tip and a great way to, to finish. Um, I spend a lot of time on the Marketing Meetup website, um, particularly the talk recordings tab. There's some fabulous talks on there. Yeah. Um, there was a great one from the middle of, maybe the middle of this year, but earlier on AI. Yeah. Um, really practical stuff about how to use AI, how to write prompts, how to give it a persona, that sort of stuff. And I just encourage everybody to spend time on the Marketing Meetup website because there's huge value there, Joe. Um, and the stuff you give back to the community is fabulous. Um, so I want to say thank you for that. And thank you for coming on today. Um, I could have carried on for a bit longer. Um, in fact, I could have carried on for a lot longer. Um, Abby, before we go and just have a final wrap up, could we just talk about next month's webinar, if that's OK? Yeah, of course. Thank you so much, Joe. That was wonderful. I think the currency of community is opportunity is an absolute pin on the wall quote. That's wonderful. And yes, in the spirit of advocacy, if everybody has enjoyed today's session, please do take Phil's advice and have a look at the marketing meetups resources because they are bloody fantastic. But in terms of next month's webinar, uh, we are being joined by Chris Budd, which I'm sure most people in the room will be familiar with. And that's to talk about the financial well-being pulse, which helps you measure the relationship between money and happiness. Until now, it's been scientifically impossible to demonstrate it, but it's really important that you understand your client's relationship between money and well-being, and then you can use the results in your marketing, in your business to help clients more. So with it being such a new proposition, we've invited Chris. I did consider calling it in conversation with Christmas Bud, but I think Phil vetoed that. I was going to put a Santa hat on Chris, but, you know, didn't ask him first. So you'll just have to pretend it's there. But he'll be joining us on the 11th of December at 10 a.m., for an hour and you can find out a bit more about the financial well-being pulse tool and how it can help you i'll put the link in the chat now but i'll also put it in the follow-up which will be out later today with the recording of this session more information about the marketing meetup and more information about the conference next march thank you abby um i think my favorite quote from you uh, joe earlier on was um 
which was when we were talking earlier about clarity is kindness. I thought that was fabulous as well. <laughs> it goes a long way. Loads of little pithy notes to write uh, up after this webinar. So if you want to catch up with Joe, um, Marketing Meetup uh, website address there, Joe's LinkedIn profile, so you can go and see the value that Joe's adding there. Joe, just want to say a huge thank you for everything you do for the marketing community, for the marketing meetup, for the LinkedIn stuff you do, and for sparing an hour with us today. It's been absolutely fabulous. And I can see from the comments that have come through on the chat, everybody else has thought the same thing as well. Thank you. Appreciate it, mate. Thank you very much for having me. And thank you yeah. for the lovely words. No problem. Thank you, Joe. Go and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Take care. Cheers, everybody. Bye-bye. Take care, guys. Bye.